Okay, so good afternoon to all our guests joining in from UK and Europe. Uh, good, good morning uh, to everyone joining in from the US. I did notice a few registrations from the University of Arkansas. And uh, a very good evening to everyone joining in from India. And uh, a late good evening to our friends from Southeast Asia and New Zealand. Again, I noticed a few uh, participants from Indonesia. Um, so a very warm welcome to our lecture series, our seminar series on the digital future for business and society, perspectives on artificial intelligence challenges and opportunities. Uh, this is hosted jointly by Professor Yogesh Divedi. Professor Yogesh Divedi is a professor of digital marketing and innovation, founding director of the Emerging Markets Research Center, EMARC, and co-director of research at the School of Management, Swansea University, Wales, UK. Professor Divedi is also currently leading the International Journal of Information Management as its editor-in-chief. Our co-host for the seminar series is Professor Ramakrishnan Raman, Director SIBM Pune and Dean Faculty of Management at Symbiosis International University. Professor Ramakrishnan Raman is a keen researcher in the area of information technology and management information systems. Allow me now to tell you a little bit about the seminar series. So the seminar series is supported by the Center for Technology, Innovation, Management and Enterprise, TIME for short, the University of Kent, UK, Digital Marketing and Analytics, Special Industry Group, Academy of Marketing, Grenoble mm. Graduate School of Management, Swansea iLab, Innovation Lab, Swansea University, the e-business and e-government Special Industry Group, British Academy of Management, and the UK Academy for Information Systems, UKs. This seminar series was inspired by various perspectives on artificial intelligence and its transformative potential presented in a recent perspective article by Divedi et al. 2019. AI undoubtedly offers a transformative potential for the augmentation and potential replacement of human tasks and activities in a wide range of industrial, intellectual, and even social applications. The pace of change for this new AI technological age is staggering with new breakthroughs in algorithmic machine learning and autonomous decision-making, creating new opportunities for continued innovation. The impact of AI could be significant with industries and sectors ranging from agriculture, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, supply chain, logistics, utilities, all potentially disrupted by the onset of AI technologies. This seminar series presents various perspectives from a number of leading expert speakers to highlight both the opportunities and the challenges posed by the rapid emergence of AI. Allow me now to introduce our speaker for today, Professor John Edwards from Aston University, Birmingham, UK. He will share with us today his perspectives on explaining decisions made by AI systems and by people. Professor John Edwards is Professor of Knowledge Management at Aston Business School, Birmingham, UK. His research interests include how knowledge affects risk management, knowledge management strategy and implementation, and the synergy of knowledge management with analytics and big data. He has published over 75 research articles and three books. He is consulting editor of the journal Knowledge Management Research and Practice. Professor Edwards, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. Let's see if I can get my screen suitably, suitably shared. Right. 
Here we go. So, great. Let's uh, let's go full screen. See if it see if the transition works okay. Right. How's that? We doing Perfect. all right? Perfect. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Right. So, good morning, afternoon, evening to you, uh, wherever you happen to be. Um, I'll set the scene for today's talk. Um, the biggest thing I should say in setting the scene is don't expect any precise answers. In fact, um, what I end up with is more like a series of questions. Uh, but what I'm proposing to do over the next 40 minutes or so is to take a tour around some of the things that we know about decisions, uh, some of the things that we know about knowledge and how that relates to decisions, and some of the things that we know about explanations and how they relate to decisions and knowledge, uh, and also, crucially perhaps, some of the things that we don't know, or at least some of the things that we haven't been looking at very carefully up to now. Um, I won't go into my history on this, but I have been working in artificial intelligence and decisions on and off for a, the best part of 40 years. So I've seen a few things come and go, and I think that helps to give a bit of perspective when whatever the latest technological developments are come along, because sometimes the people behind them are technologists. Not surprisingly, they're very enthusiastic about their technology, but there is sometimes a bit of a step in going from the development of a technology to putting it in, in use in society in a way that a large number of people will accept. So let's frame it a bit better. Organizations make decisions about us that affect our lives. Um, to give you two obvious examples that I'll come back to later, um, you might go to a hospital or a doctor and get a diagnosis that you're suffering from some medical ailment or disease. Alternatively, you might be applying for a loan and the bank or organization that you're applying to may grant it, they may not grant it, but either way, whatever the decision, it's going to have an effect on your life. Same is true if us turned out to be a business rather than just an individual. Again, other organizations are making decisions about us. Do we get a regional development grant if we want to build a new factory in this particular location or not? Now, these decisions that the organizations are making are presumably based on information and or knowledge to some extent, uh, unless they're taken completely at random. And while you may feel that you've experienced a random decision by an organization or a government in the past, um, if it's random, there's nothing I can say. So let's assume that there is a core of logic to the decisions that are being made. In which case, can we understand how and especially why a particular decision that affects us has been taken in the way that it has. And what I'd like to flag up about that sentence is that how and why are not the same. So for example, you can sometimes be given an explanation that isn't a lot of use. Um, if you travel on a train in, in the UK, although there's not much of that going on at the moment, passenger numbers are some less than 10% of their usual levels because of lockdown. Um, but if the train's delayed, you will sometimes be told that the train is delayed because the train in front is delayed. Uh, this is logically true, but it's no use in terms of understanding what's going on. <laughs> You could, in fact, imagine if you're going, say, from Edinburgh to London, you could have a whole sequence of about 20 trains, which are all delayed because the train in front is delayed. And that doesn't really tell you when you're going to get to London. So can we understand this? If there's some kind of core of information and knowledge, we would hope that the answer is yes, to an extent. And is that going to be easier or harder if the decision was made by an AI system? Um, automated decision making has been coming, becoming more and more popular 
over the last 10 years, but it's not without its critics, um, especially in terms of data protection and in terms of civil liberties or perhaps bias in decisions. So finally, where the talk will end up is how might explanations be improved in the future? And uh, I don't want to raise your expectations unnecessarily. It's might. In other words, these are directions to pursue that I see as possible having a payoff. But um, we don't know the answers to that yet. So don't expect all the answers, but do expect quite a lot of the questions. So what I'll actually be covering, we'll start with some definitions. Then we'll think a bit about people and explanations. Then we'll get on to automated systems of all kinds, but including AI and explanations. And finally, challenges, opportunities and future research possibilities, which is where we'll end up. So the most obvious definition that we need is to do with explanations. Explainability is the definition I'll use. It's the ability to explain the reasoning, crucial word, we're assuming there's a core there, behind a particular decision, classification, or forecast. However, as I indicated on the first slide, there are actually two types of explanation. There's the how explanation, which is the logical chain of argument, this train is late because the train in front is late. Yeah, that makes logical sense, but it's not a why explanation. We still have no idea why trains are late generally. Give you another example of that. Um, during lockdown, I've been doing a fair amount of shopping online and I ordered three shirts in different colors from the same manufacturer. Same style, just different, same size, obviously, just different color. Two of them came together the next day. The third one came from a different place a week later. So I can guess at the how part of the explanation for that. The stocks they had of the shirts were in a different place. But again, what I don't understand, although in this case it doesn't matter a lot unless I wanted that one urgently, I don't understand why their stocks of dark blue shirts were in a different place from their stocks of shirts in another color. So that's the difference that we're on about. How is simply because, 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 because. Yeah, okay, that's, that's the chain you work through, tick the boxes. But why? Why is the chain even like that? Never mind what are the reasons. So I said I'd start with people and decisions. How do people explain their decisions? Well, actually, in a word, poorly. People are generally very bad at explaining the real reason why they've made a particular decision. Um, there's studies into interview panels and how they work, which suggest that in fact, most of the panel have made up their mind about a candidate by the time that they've come into the room, walked across to the chair, said hello and sat down. And they formed something like 75% of their decision already at that point. But they probably wouldn't admit that even to themselves. They'll say, ah, oh, it's because this person's got a good degree, a degree from a good university like Swansea or like SIBM Pune. But actually, it will probably be all to do with the way that they walked across the room and made eye contact when they said hello and so on. However, some people are much better at explaining decisions in a way that other people can understand than other people. And this is in part why some people make good teachers and some don't. We'll come back to that a bit later on. And one of the reasons for this can be understood using concepts from knowledge management. Indeed, probably the most basic concept in knowledge management is the idea that knowledge comes in two types, explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. 
explicit knowledge is able to be codified. That's what explicit means. So you can write it down as a set of rules. You can put it in a computer system. Back in the day, you could, you could put it on a tick sheet. Now you could put it in a computer system. Any database package would be able to operate such a set of rules. And because you can codify it, because you can set it out, you can share it very easily. And there are a lot of fairly simple bits of explicit knowledge out there in the background whenever we use any kind of computer software, even things as simple as remembering your preferences and so on are all related to explicit knowledge. However, tacit knowledge is much harder. It's actually, not only is it almost impossible to codify it, but even the person who has it can't necessarily explain it. There was a, a chap named Michael Polanyi, is a researcher who's generally credited with um, explaining this concept well. And he was actually a scientist, uh, a hard scientist, who moved more into the more philosophical aspects as his career went on. And he came up with the memorable phrase, we can know more than we can tell. In other words, there are things in your head and in my head that no matter how we try, we can't get over to other people. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you boil a kettle to make a cup of tea or anything else, preferred beverage, can you tell from the noise that the kettle is making when it's just about to boil? I can. I know people who can't. I think on balance, most people, but I wouldn't like to measure it, 80% maybe, most people can, but some people can't. And even if you try to tell them, well, the, you could tell them that the noise is sort of, it's getting quieter in one way and louder in another, but, but you can't explain it. Whereas I just know, ah, I can hear the kettle is about to boil. That's tacit knowledge. So, crucial mistake that a lot of people who are new to knowledge management make is to assume that if you've got a piece of knowledge, whatever that looks like, I suppose there's some on the shelves behind me, although most of that's fiction, um, that it's either tacit or explicit. No, absolutely wrong. All pieces of knowledge have got both explicit and tacit elements, but the balance between them varies. And I find it easiest to think about them that you've got the explicit knowledge around the outside of a tacit core. So riding a bicycle is the classic tacit task. There is also almost no useful explicit knowledge in learning how to ride a bicycle. Um, sit on the saddle, hold the handlebars. It's not even put your feet on the pedals because if you put your feet on the pedals now, you'll fall over. So, almost no explicit knowledge. Riding a bicycle is almost entirely tacit. You have to learn to do it for yourself. Other people know, and they have a rough idea when you're doing it wrong, but they can't tell you how to do it right. And speaking as somebody who has not succeeded in learning to ride a bicycle, and it seems to be genetic because my mother couldn't either, they can't tell you how to do it. At the other end of the scale, if you work for a company, you may well put in an expenses claim and the processing of that is almost entirely explicit. There will be a tacit core, but it'll be quite small. It'll be, oh yeah, tacit knowledge is, this is called a seminar, but we count it as a lecture or a workshop. So you can claim for that. Or somewhere in the middle, making a piece of furniture. The size of the tacit element here will depend on whether it's designer furniture or mass market furniture. But while some of it is explicit, like the joints have to fit together and that's really a matter of physics, there's tacit knowledge. What looks right, how do you actually get all the legs to be the same then? <laughs> yeah, there's physics in there, but actually doing it involves tacit knowledge. So 
all pieces of knowledge involve both explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. Right, let's bring in decision making in the light of this. Well, research suggests that human experts actually have two different ways of making decisions. And I'm talking here about real experts, you know, the consultant you would want to go to if you're really worried about a disease you might have, or the top architect that you're consulting about your new building. And two different groups of people from different backgrounds actually came up with this independently. The, the Dreyfus brothers came from the world of artificial intelligence. They, they have been probably the biggest critics of artificial intelligence over about 50 years. Whereas Daniel Kahneman comes from decision making and probability. And as far as I know, he wasn't actually aware of the Dreyfus brothers work when he came up with what was effectively the same idea and uh, made a very successful book writing about it. So the two ways of making the decisions are slow and reasoned. So you're thinking your way through a series of steps and that relies more on explicit knowledge. And medical students learn a lot of these series of steps, the things that you check for when you're thinking, I wonder if this patient has got kidney problems or whatever. And there's quick and intuitive, which relies mainly on tacit knowledge. And it's that quick and intuitive knowledge in a crisis, which often gets experts their reputation for being expert. Ah, I know what we should do here. Um, I won't say anything about COVID. Ask me in two or three years time who got it right. But what often makes an expert expert is that on the spot, they can make the right decision. You would like the pilot flying your plane to be good at doing that because most of the time the pilot isn't even doing anything. The autopilot's flying the plane using the explicit knowledge. But if you do need the human pilot, you want a good human pilot because the situation is difficult by definition these days. Now, the problem is, the more tacit knowledge is involved, the harder a human decision is to explain. If it's basically a tick list, you go through the tick list with the person you're explaining it to. But if you thought, oh, I, I just knew that what we wanted to do was swerve the plane to the left at that moment, you won't be able to recreate that. Now, What's interesting is that if you come at this problem from a different direction, and the direction is the public understanding of science, because especially at the moment, public understanding of science is very important. But if the scientists just talk in their usual jargon, we won't understand them. My apologies, if any of you are scientists, you may understand them, but you know, I was a mathematician, but I don't understand enough chemistry or biology. Now, Harry Collins has done a lot of work on public understanding. And one of the things he's established is some of the best commentators, coaches, communicators, critics have never been any good at actually doing the thing they're talking about. So here we've got um, Harsha Bogle, who I'm told is often voted as India's most popular cricket commentator. Um, he did play cricket for his university, but he's never played at high level at all. And here we have John Motson, who's recently retired as Britain's number one football commentator. And um, Motson went to a school that played rugby rather than football. So as far as I can establish, he never played competitive football at any level whatsoever. He'd only ever played friendly games in the past. But they are acknowledged as the people who will explain to you what is going on. Now, yes, some people who have been very good are also very good at communicating. I think Sunil Gavaskar is pretty good on the cricket side. Gary Lineker is pretty good on the football side. But there are also hundreds of former cricketers and footballers out there who are no good. 
and not surprisingly, you don't hear them more than a couple of times. So this suggests that explanation is actually a different skill from doing. Collins calls it interactional expertise and arguably what these people are doing, what they're good at, is spanning the boundary between the how, which makes sense to the experts in the field, and the why, which is what the person who needs the explanation would like to have. So let's turn to automated decisions because an awful lot of thinking about explaining automated decisions thinks that it's the same skill as doing because that's where the research is. Can we do this? Can we make a system that makes loan decisions, that diagnoses kidney diseases or whatever? Now, there are two principal types of automated system. There's rule-based systems, and back in the 1980s, these were known as artificial intelligence, although some people in artificial intelligence these days would argue that that's not true anymore. These are built from knowledge that by definition is explicit. You can read the rules. The rules can be translated into English or Hindi or whatever, and you can look at them. And it's straightforward to identify which rules led to the particular decision to grant this loan, or more likely, if people are asking about it, not to grant this loan. <laughs> then AI systems, and increasingly these days, AI systems are based on what's called deep learning using technologies that are generally, but not always, based on artificial neural networks. I haven't got time for any more detail of that now. Now, the output of a deep learning system has some important similarities to tacit knowledge. The system is designed to make the decision, not to explain it. It literally cannot explain how or why it produced that output, at least not in any way that humans would understand. So if you take something these systems are quite good at, um, recognizing some sorts of faces, there is nothing that can be said. It's just the system has gone through all the pixels and has decided that this is a picture of Yogesh Dwivedi. <laughs> and probably it is, but maybe it isn't. And whether it is or not, the system cannot explain how or why it produced that particular output. But even if we take the rule-based systems, and let's start with those because they're easier, there are some issues. Who makes the rules? The most obvious. The rules got in there somehow. Where did they come from? Who made the rules? Who's responsible for checking that the rules are still right? And second, who is the explanation for? Decision rules are actually social, not just technical. This is the same point that Collins was making about explanation. So Tsukas and Vladimiru point out, members of a community must share an interpretation as to what a rule means before they apply it. So if you've got an AI system with rules in it, someone still has to have looked at the rules. But if the rules being applied by software whose interpretation is built into the software? Do we even know? Especially if the software has actually derived the rules itself. And there have been systems around for almost 40 years that are capable of looking at data and generating rules, some of which are good, some of which are not so good, but either way, they are essentially an artifact of the design of the system, but even the designers may not know exactly what the implications of what they've done would be. So, in case you're struggling with this, let's take an example from the 80s. It's a medical example. So imagine yourself in the role of the patient here. Um, you've got pains in the lower part of your body. And the conclusion from the system is that the patient has 
I don't even know how to pronounce this, cholestasis and surgery is advised. Most of us, I think, will be sitting there the same. What on earth is cholestasis? And I hear the word surgery, I'm worried. Right, now, two different types of explanation. The how explanation is for the developers and the doctors. And I don't understand some of this either. The patient has high blood bilirubin, whatever that is, jaundice, I think I understand what that is. And the x-rays suggest an obstruction in the biliary duct. I'm not too sure what that is either because that's a technical term, but I'm beginning to see a pattern here with the word obstruction and surgery. But this is for the people building the system to make sure that it's actually saying that the patient has cholestasis, whatever that is, when it should. But that's still no real use to me as the patient. What I need instead is, Professor Edwards, I'm sorry to say that you've got an obstruction in your bile duct, but the good news is that we can remove it by surgery and you should be all right after that. But this is fundamentally a different explanation from that one. And it's written in a different sort of language. It's written in language that most intelligent patients would understand. I think I might have said, I don't know, I'm not sure if intestine is right, but I might have changed that term. I'm not changing the original paper. This is the more precise language that the developers need to use to get it right. But this explanation is not much use to me as a patient, whereas this one is. And that is a crucial area. So, what you need is to tell me why, not to tell me how. The title here is a joke. I'll leave that for those two of you to, who are not as old as I am to follow that up. Now, the serious point is many jurisdictions, especially the European Union, which is probably the biggest under their general data protection regulations, require that organizations provide explanations of automated decisions on request. That's request by the person that the decision's about, or presumably the organization. We've just seen that how explanations need to be different from why explanations. But 32 years after the example that I put up two slides ago, most of the AI literature still tacitly, pun intended, assumes that how explanations are all that really matters. And you will actually find that a lot of the literature doesn't even refer to explainability. It uses a term like interpretability. So the AI literature is concentrating on the how explanations, but at a guess, the EU probably is thinking about why explanations. So let's move on to the challenges. I reckon I've got about 10 minutes left, so I think time's working out okay. Most research into explanations uses a good human explanation as a gold standard. We want Harsha Bogle explaining why England have declared at that point. We want John Motsom saying why Liverpool have made a substitution. We want a really good doctor who can explain to me what the risks are of the operation that he thinks I need. But if that was a quick and intuitive decision, so this time it's not, I've got problems, I've got pains, I've come here, I've done lots of tests, it's, I've collapsed in the street. I've been rushed into A&E or the ER. I should have checked what they're called in Indian hospitals. Sorry about that. And it might need a very quick decision as to what's wrong with me because I'm unconscious and they can't ask me where it hurts. Could even a human expert provide a good why explanation? And I think the answer to that is we don't know, but what Polanyi said suggests that maybe not. And that means the human explanation process is a much more complex one than is usually recognized in the AI literature, which again, assumes a how explanation will do. 
Also, a second aspect of challenge, most research into explanation assumes a cooperative or collaborative context. Just need a sip of water. And for a doctor and a patient, that's probably fine. But if you're querying a loan decision, it might be a better definition to describe it as antagonistic. Why have you rejected my application for a loan? And there is not much research that has that as the background context. You're actually trying to explain a decision to somebody who is really unhappy about it. However, there are some pluses. Oh, sorry. A how explanation, as we've said before, may be logically correct, but if a layperson can't understand it, does it meet the legal requirements? I don't think anyone knows yet. On the plus side, even a simple explanation can be helpful. Anything like you've got an obstruction in your intestine, you'll understand it needs surgery. Simple as that, no more detail. Now, some explanations are easier than others. There's no real emotional content with decisions about allocating space in a design of a building. There is a lot of emotional context in saying you're going to have to have an operation. Is it possible to devise principles for good explanations from domains where they're easy and transfer those to ones where it's more difficult, like medicine? We don't know, but it would be great if it could be done that way. So if we can explain why have you said that this is a picture of a tree, it doesn't really matter if the system gets it wrong, to one where why have you said I need an, an operation, where it does matter if the system gets it wrong. Another possibility is that explanations for automated decisions may not need to be structured the same way as explaining human decisions. There's a little bit of research into explanation that says one of the AI systems that recognizes scenes, there is literally one neuron in the neural network that fires if it recognizes a tree in the picture in which case it's going to conclude that the scene is probably outdoors. Not always true. There are some places with indoor trees, shopping malls, for example. There are some places like the Shetland Islands, which are outdoors, but don't have any trees because it's so windy there. However, it's possible that an explanation might be completely different. So for example, maybe it could show you a picture or a diagram of some form rather than telling you in words. You know, maybe the doctor shows me a picture of my lower body and there's a bright red bit there. <laughs> That's got to go. It might work. It might work very well for some people. The other aspect, which is definitely an opportunity, we judge human experts on two things, how competent they are and how warm they are. People like Harsha Bogle and John Motson, because they're both, they know what they're talking about and they're warm people. But information systems research generally, not just AI, into explanation, has almost entirely concentrated on competence. It's simply a question of, is it right? Not, is it being done in a, a helpful and understanding, a sharing sort of way? And the research on human decisions suggests that if it's a choice between competence and warmth, we'll go for competence. That makes sense. 
if I've got a choice between a doctor who knows what she's doing and a doctor who's nice, I'm going to go for the doctor who knows what she's doing, even if I don't like her very much and she snaps at me. But competence and warmth is better still. Maybe AI systems need a bit more warmth. So a summary then of what I see as the research challenges. Number one, can explanations that are built on a single approach of understanding what the system's doing then be tailored to different classes of explainee? The IS professionals who developed the system, the doctors who've provided the expertise, nurses who maybe have to deal with the recommendations and the patient. Is that possible or does it all have to be done differently for each different group? Again, I said I'd finish with questions. This is a question. I don't know the answer, but if the answer was yes, it will make everybody's life a lot easier. Second, what sort of explanation would best demonstrate compliance with statute or regulation? I've given a hint that why explanations are a lot better than how explanations. But would a picture be legal? Obviously, that might vary between different countries. We don't know. Worth exploring. Third, understanding a bit more about the validity and acceptability of using probabilities in AI explanations. Now, for over 40 years, probabilities have been used in explaining things. They are routinely used by doctors. If you get any medicine, it will say side effects. There is a less than one in a hundred chance that you will get this sort of side effect and less than a one in a thousand chance that you'll get these. Does the average person in the street really understand probabilities? Kahneman, who we mentioned a while back, has done lots of research which suggests even experienced decision makers don't really understand probabilities. So does anyone who isn't a statistician actually understand probabilities? If they don't, why are we using them to supposedly explain things? Number four, can't we improve the explanation of all decisions, not just automated ones? You know, people are affected by a lot of decisions that are still being made by humans, and that's just as well. Can we improve human? Can we tell doctors how to explain things better to their patients in language the patient will understand? And finally, a lot of the literature on information systems work in explanations suggests that there is a straight trade-off between how transparent the explanation is, how easy it is to understand, and how quickly the system performs. So basically, the more explanation you want, the slower the system runs. And it's, it's a curve shaped like that. So the question is, can we jump off the curve? Can we be an outlier? Is there an approach which will give more transparency and still give good performance? And that maybe is one as much for the technologists as everybody else. So, as I said at the start, I will end with questions rather than answers. I missed a chance to get another, um, another music reference in there. Never mind. There are more questions than answers. You can research that one for yourself. Who sang that? Um, the references are there in case anyone needs them. Uh, I can make my slides available afterwards if we can come up with a mechanism for doing that, incidentally. And, whoops, that was the end of what I've got to say. Um, shall I stop sharing my screen at this point? Sure, Dr. Edwards, we can actually open up for some questions. Okay. Right, over to you. Are you a fan of the Beatles? Uh, yes, I gr literally grew up with the Beatles. Okay. Uh, the 60s were very interesting. Uh, I was a teenager by the end of the 60s, but not at the start. Right. And I quite like the way that you framed their names as if they had written a research paper. 
Yep. The the other very interesting thing which kind of grabbed my attention beyond your wonderfully lucid talk on AI was the sharp distinction between the how and the why, and my mind went actually back to Rudyard Kipling, uh, who who started off his uh, famous poem about his six wise men, and the how and the why is kind of the core of uh, strategic management, uh, which is uh, one of the very useful subjects in these schools. Yep. So, uh, with your permission, uh, can we open up for some questions, Doctor? Certainly. Yes, please. Okay. okay. So we have a question from um, Annie Tobaji, who's from Swansea University. So she says, uh, "Thank you, dear Professor Edwards, for the wonderful, clear, precise, and beautifully illustrated with examples talk." Two questions, and I'll um, uh, share the first one first. What is your preferred literature on why and how distinction in the decision-making literature? Um, yeah, I th I think if if you start by following up some of the references that I've given in this paper, that will give some clues as to as to where to look because quite a lot of understanding came out of the first wave of AI systems in the 80s, but a lot of it has not been picked up by the AI work that's been racing ahead technologically over the last five to 10 years. So I would say, start with a look at some of those, um, have a look at the Dreyfus and Dreyfus and Kahneman ones uh, in particular, and take it, they won't necessarily use how and why in the way that I do, but you'll see the same concepts in there. Thank and you. then the second part of the question was about digital exclusion. Indeed. Um, right. Which is the biggest source? The rules, the bias or missing info for certain groups? Um, I don't think anyone knows. Um, all of them are potentially a problem, as is what you decide to do with them. Um, because in, in the UK last summer, there was a very big issue over the exams taken by school leavers because they couldn't actually take their exams because of the lockdown. And it was decided that estimates of their grades would be given by the teachers based where possible on the work they'd already done and that these would then be moderated by an algorithm. And that had problems that went across all four of these reasons because effectively the algorithm assumed that the profile of results of this year's students would be the same as the average profile in that school in that subject over the last three years. So that's an immediate problem. Why should your year be the same as last year, the year before, especially if it's in a school that has been trying really hard to improve? The second problem with that is that your result is being judged on the basis of someone else's ability. So you might be incredibly good, but there might be somebody else in your class who's incredibly better. So you might be, it's 1980, I'm at the Moscow Olympics. You might be Seb Co, but there is also a Steve Ovet and you can't both win. And then the third issue is, statistically, they could only do that if the group size was large enough. This meant that if you did a popular subject in a big school, you would get the algorithm. Whereas if you did an unpopular subject in a small school, or an unpopular subject in any school really, the algorithm would not be applied and it would solely be the teachers, so you could all win. And only after it was pointed out to them did the people in charge realize that that would benefit private schools and disadvantage the big public sixth form colleges, which have the largest classes and logically enough, do the most popular subjects. So it was all of those and a bit more. So uh, I, I'm a systems person. I take a holistic view of this. You've got to get everything right. You've got to get the data in there, including the data that you haven't actually got at the moment and will have to go out to collect. 
you've got to get the rules right and you've got to use it in a sensible manner. As um, another popular culture reference from years ago, as Captain Kirk once said to Mr. Spock, ah, you reasoned that it was time for an emotional outburst. <laughs> so you've got to know when do you ignore the rules? Right, I, th I think yeah. I've answered that one. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have a question from Soumya Srikumar, uh, who's uh, from SIBM Pune from the MBA first year program. Uh, so he's asking, AI systems greatly depend on training the system on data, but the availability yeah. of good data and its scarcity is a big challenge. And even uh, data bias and data security can be really worrisome. So how can AI be given a better shape, given those constraints for the larger benefit of the business ecosystem? Mm. Yeah, um, Tom Davenport, who's well known in the business literature and goes back a long way, has recently been writing about um, the problems of, uh, he called it deploying data science. But it's much the same as I'm gonna say now that You've got to put your effort into making sure that your system links with the real world. It doesn't matter how well it works in your training environment. For your training environment, you can use the data that you've got. That's fine. But for the real world, it's got to deal with the whole range of cases that are in the real world. And if it hasn't got data on that full range of cases, you cannot claim that it can comprehensively make all the decisions. So we might say, yeah, okay, you can use this system for adult white male patients, but you can't use it for anyone else because that's who we had data on. So I, I think giving it a better shape involves literally bringing in different people to work with some of the technologists. You need the Harsha Bogle and John Motson sort of person, the person who understands enough about the technology to make that step and say, hang on, if you use your algorithm this way, it's going to give a big advantage to private schools. Have you realized that? What? <laughs> and quite often, um, you know, I did a maths degree in Cambridge. I grew up with some of these people. I know how tunnel vision they can be. It is actually often true that some of the brightest developers of AI types of system have not thought about any of those issues. So it relies on someone else telling them. And that, that's obviously, that's a management decision. But uh, for me, I think that's the issue. Above all, don't fall into the trap of using the data that you've got because that's the data that you've got. Yeah, that's fine if you just want a proof of concept saying, yeah, in theory, we've got a system that can read x-rays, grant loans, um, recognize people carrying weapons or whatever. That's fine as a proof of concept, but don't pretend that that's a system that you can use for making real life decisions about real life people. Um, it can interestingly work the other way. Apparently um, they've been using a biometric system in the UK and they've, they've used it on 23,000, a facial recognition system on 23,000 people. And it hasn't yet detected anyone who seemed to be um, trying to travel under a false identity. So either it's very good or the system's useless or it's solving a problem that didn't exist. And at the moment, without further study, you can't tell which. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Uh, so we have a query from Laurie Hughes. So she says, uh, thank you, John. I'm assuming it's a she. Um, thank you, John. Do you feel He's that- a he. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. My apologies. He, he was when I met him anyway. <laughs> uh, so Laurie says, thank you, John. Do you feel that there is any momentum at present in academic research on this topic, engendering any change in policy or decision-making by authorities? 
looking to the future, do you think there's likely to be a pivot point that will force change and improve explainability in AI? Mm. I think the key word in that question is the use of the word authorities, because quite a few government and other official or semi-official bodies are moving in this direction. The, the intention of the EU GDPR seems to go in that way. But there are a lot of individual countries that are making moves in that sort of direction as to what the government expectations are for how explanation, how AI systems should be used and what recourse the users would have either after or preferably before an inappropriate decision is made. I think the problem is that the authorities move far less quickly than the big technological giants. So um, for all I know, and you'll be able to tell because I'll be instantly cut off, um, for all I know, the people behind Zoom are collecting all sorts of data about this call <laughs> and using it for purposes that I perhaps do not know. But the serious point about that is Facebook and Google and Microsoft are much quicker at bringing products to market than any government that I've known over my 68 years. <laughs> and that is one of the issues that governments and companies that are lawful good that don't actually have to do this quickly and just see AI as a way to improve their service at the margin they can take the time to do it well, do it appropriately. And I think in that sense, they're taking notice of the academic points. But Microsoft, Facebook, Google were all founded by technologists. They're mostly still run by technologists and the technology leads the way. There is a tendency to implement it first and then deal with the problems afterwards. Um, I think perhaps, Elon Musk is perhaps the biggest example at the moment of someone where the technology is very clearly leading the way. Um, and that leads to some amazing strategy changes of, of Tesla as a company. Indeed. But it's not always appropriate for the rest of the world. And, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to get an AI apocalypse, but we could get an AI major inconvenience. That's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Uh, next question says, uh, it's from Ashish from IIT Karakur. So IIT is the Indian Institute of Technology. Yeah. Um, so he says, warmth aspect is being overused these days to counterbalance incompetence. For example, there are chatbots which are incredibly warm, but many of them are very limited in terms of their functionality. People might overtrust these systems because of tactics to mimic human interactions used by developers of these systems. My question, is explainability really required to get users to trust these systems? Um, I would say yes, because my understanding, and I don't claim to be an expert in this, is that the research on human explanations, it's absolutely clear. Competence beats warmth every time. And basically, warmth is okay once or in things that don't matter. If Netflix rec recommends me a film I don't like, it's really not much of a problem. If my doctor recommends me a medicine that makes me ill and that maybe he should have known about beforehand, it's a big problem. So I think people will put up with an incredibly warm chatbot because the interaction is part of the fun. But when you realize that you've spent ages working with this and you still haven't got your problem sorted out, you will realize that you will put up with a very structured thing that was competent and could actually do something. You should not be having to sit there and try to work out how do I get through to the team who deals with deceased relatives for bank accounts, say. How do I type my query to get to the right bit? Ah, you want bereavement team. So that's a bit of my learning from last year, which may help anyone else. All the UK major banks 
the key word you have to type in is not deceased or anything, it's bereavement. Okay. I think Professor Yogesh uh, would like to add a few things. Uh, yes, sir, please, please. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Edwards. Uh, obviously, very detailed talk and uh, some points are really insightful and I can see some participants have intuited to say that how much they loved your talk. So thank you so much. Um, you. Just recently, I saw a news um, on BBC actually and saying that um, some guys did some experiment in USA and um, you know, when you go to doctor and if you have pain, they say, well, you know, what is scale you have pain? And apparently, um, you know, doctor generally misjudges the pain uh, depending who they're asking. So if black is asking, they probably underestimate that while they're, they're thinking about white is more precise. Uh, however, when they applied AI-based system, obviously, not obviously, but the AI-based system better, better predicted the pain point of uh, people. Um, and the challenge is obviously the prediction is fine. It's much more accurate than what doctor did, but explainability is not there. That what basis actually um, the AI is determining if the pain point is, should be uh, eight out of 10 for this patient rather than um, uh, five or six or seven. So in, is the, in this case, explain explainability matters or not? Uh, and if it matters, um, you know, would be using this kind of AI-based system uh, or not for these kind of purposes? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a question of how much better it is than the other one. And I say, people will put up with just having competence if, and, and no explanation at all, if the answer is good enough, but it's got to be it's got to be good enough. Um, we had a really, really annoying teacher when I was at school, but he was there because in, in, in my day, if you wanted to go to Oxford or Cambridge, you had to pass an exam in Latin. And his job was to make sure that the scientists passed Latin. And he was horrible, but if you did everything that he told you to do, you would pass. And, and that's the test, I think, for some of these systems. If they are always right, people will put up with it. But it will be better. Competence beats warmth, but competence and warmth, like our French teacher, is much better still. So, you know, I think that the most crucial thing is to make sure that it's got proper data on all kinds of people being input to give it a chance of doing better and indeed maybe better than some of the rules that the doctors were trained on because the the other one of the other crucial things is gender in medicine there are an awful lot of very common treatments out there which have only ever been tested on adult males because that was how they used to do things so you know it's it's a very complex picture there's an awful lot of context around the around the edges thank you john and just one more thing obviously um, you mentioned that um, you know lots of research done in 80s and 90s and um, but the new research actually not picking the research done earlier so do you think that you know people are just kind of reinventing uh, lots of things without really bothering to so see what is already done uh, earlier. Uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's often the case because they're not looking in the right place. So, for example, a lot of good work in the 80s appeared in the International Journal, what's now the International Journal of Human Computer Studies. It changed its name during that decade. It started off as the International Journal of Man-Machine Studies. <laughs> So you can see why they changed it. But 
that I don't think is a journal that most IS people would think of looking at now. But a lot of the stuff that they published in the 80s on rule-based systems was very, very good. Uh, it is a question of knowing where to look. You know, basically, just because a journal is good now doesn't mean that it was a good journal 30 years ago. Uh, and, and that, I think, is perhaps a lesson which many parts of academia don't realize. Yes, you get some things like Nature, which has always been a great journal. Um, but to look at things another way around, the European Journal of Marketing is now regarded as pretty good. In the 1990s, it definitely wasn't. Um, so, you know, these things, these things change over time. Um, there are big names in all kinds of industries from the 80s or 90s that don't exist anymore. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't lessons to be learned from what they did in the 80s or 90s. You know, it, it would be like saying, well, if you look in Britain, um, newspapers like the News Chronicle and the London Evening News no longer exist. Therefore, when I'm researching history, it's not worth looking back at what they said at the time. And yet they might be the best newspapers to look at. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. There's a, there's a query from uh, Annie Tobaji. So she says, I wonder how did this AI that Professor Divedi mentioned avoided racial bias while we know many AI are victim of it because of learning from human beings. Any insight on this put differently? Would, would AI detect pain better? I don't know the system, but I think if it, in this case, it would definitely come down to the data if you've got good enough data. Um, but again, there's gender issues here. It's anecdote says that women tolerate pain better than men. I really don't know if that's true, but that's what anecdote says. I do know from an interest in track and field athletics, there have certainly been some top athletes who have a much higher pain threshold than other people. And you see them doing things like running with a broken leg. You know, there are two, two examples of this. Um, so, I don't know, for me, I think it, if the data is good enough, then you've got a chance. Indeed. Professor Yogesh, uh, we are uh, at the top end of the hour, so... Oh, yeah, there's just, a question. One more, just one more question is there by sure. Caroline Chama, if you look at. Sure, sure. So, for some reason, I, I'm unable to see it. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I can see it. It's about the um, catch up of governments in developing regions. Yeah. Um, I think. Developing regions have both an advantage, have, uh, it's, it's both an advantage and a disadvantage in that from the government point of view, it often gives a chance to learn from what some of the more developed economies have already done and, and got wrong. And also because they are often not cursed with the bigger infrastructure of a developed economy and therefore it's perhaps easier to introduce changes because you can bring in a system without changing all the links that you've got to several other systems that are already there. On the other hand, if you have a disreputable private firm, they might feel happier about testing something a bit dubious in a developing economy where perhaps the complaints wouldn't be quite so organized as they would in a more developed economy. And, um, you know, there are anecdotes about where this might have been happening in the past, but of course it's almost impossible to prove any of this. So, you know, my, my feeling is it, it is urgent to do the thinking about it, 
it's not necessarily it's not necessarily urgent to introduce ai for ai's sake but if you can introduce ai well and sometimes if you've got the data and the way that different countries use social media for example is actually very different and this is this is often not widely realized um there are differences even between european countries on this quite considerable differences there is still for example one of the things about lockdown german consumers don't use credit cards anything like as much as british or french or american consumers now this wasn't an issue but in lockdown it suddenly is a real issue because if you're having to stay at home and get everything delivered you need to do it by credit card you can't use cash or checks so it was more of a problem for german consumers in shifting to a home delivery model than it was for british consumers i don't know enough about specific developing countries i think it might be interesting to look at vietnam which is an economy that is progressing very fast in some areas and is actually still very much in the developing stage in others but i, I don't know enough about um economies of other countries um strangely one of the reasons for this as i was explaining before the start is uh, i don't do any teaching anymore and that's one of the things i miss from my interactions with the students is not just interactions about the subject but interactions about all the things that go round the edge of the subject because that for example was how i first realized how advanced south korea was in using the internet was from talking to students in my class who were sort of saying oh everybody in korea does that um and we think what um so that's one thing i miss i'm possibly not the best person to ask on that then sure. south korea have the highest internet penetration in the world yeah and the the best bandwidth i mean they even public buses on the streets have uh, broadband wi-fi yeah uh, amazing country the interesting question is which of those came first and of course it's a reinforcing cycle that yeah. they have this high usage therefore there's the demand for better bandwidth therefore because of the better bandwidth it's easier to use and so on it, it all it all goes together in fact uh, a very venerable uh, uk brand uh, tesco uh, went ahead and did a wonderful series of uh, stores which they branded as home plus and they uh, these were virtual stores and they branded it i mean they were able to operate it thanks to the uh, strength of the internet backbone in the country and i believe they are now the number two um, consumer product uh, outlet uh, in the country um, so that that yeah, kind of I mean, tells us certainly from uk experience tesco are the most agile online retailer but the uk supermarkets generally have responded to the pandemic brilliantly and i think arguably in many ways a lot better than the government though full marks to the government on the vaccination side where they're doing very well indeed professor edwards can we take one last question with your permission yep. certainly i've got another 10 minutes if necessary okay. all right all right so we have a question from mohina gandhi so she says uh, professor edward thanks for your insightful session can you please share your views if images are already being used in policy documents for better explainability yeah i i think um people have been using diagrams either well or badly um for at least 150 years in various documents um florence nightingale is very well known as a nurse but actually what she was good at was visualizing data and it was her diagram showing the causes of death of british soldiers in the crimea and the graph that she presented showing how much more clearly this was caused by illness in the camps rather than being shot by the enemy or whatever it was that that influenced the government policy on that so you know there's 150 years of of good stuff on this the the best reference on visualization is still edward r tufte's book t u f t e his name on how to draw graphs well um what it's not doing that i know of is coming into legal argument 
because as far as I'm aware, except for something like a map showing a location, illustrations don't have the same legal force as words in the UK. So that they're a piece of evidence, but they don't have the same legal force in, in much the same way as the the British legal system doesn't formally recognize the existence of mathematics. So if you've got anything mathematical, you can't write an equation for calculating something. You have to write it out in words. And there is a marvelous thing called the statutory instrument for explaining how the single transferable vote election system works in words without using any equations or formulae. So as far as I know, not used in a legal context yet, but there's 150 years of examples of good diagrams and bad diagrams um, that you can learn from. Um, one of the disadvantages has been that software has enabled bad diagrams to produce much more quickly. So for example, the default colors in an Excel chart are absolutely wrong. They, they, they are done as a set of colors that look nice as colors. In terms of actually helping you to understand the charts you're looking at, they are a very bad choice of colors indeed. They don't contrast well enough from each other. They're basically all the same kind of shade of pastel something or other. That's not what you want if you're actually using the colors to understand better. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Edwards. Uh, so you're yeah, well out of time and uh, Professor Yogesh, with uh, your permission, um, shall we move to the vote of thanks? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So Professor John Edwards, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful you're talk. Welcome. And um, uh, I can clearly see a very sharp sense of humor lurking under the calm visage of the very experienced professor. Uh, and uh, kudos to you for that, because um, it's, it's rare to have someone uh, so experienced from the academic community who still has uh, a huge sense of humor. So thank you very much for your talk and the way you delivered it. Really, really wonderful. Um, at our peak, uh, we could see f approximately 55 participants logged on. So it kind of tied in with the forecast, uh, which I made uh, to you at the beginning of our uh, session. So thanks a ton. Uh, thank you, Professor Yogesh. Thanks to Professor Raman for uh, co-hosting uh, today's uh, session. Uh, thanks to all the participants um, who joined in and their uh, active questions that uh, came through. Uh, it would be remiss on my part not to mention our IT team led by Rajesh Bhagavadi, who enabled the entire IT infrastructure for today's session. And uh, last but not the least, we have a student team at SIBM Pune called iSmart, and uh, they have attended the session as well. And uh, they will uh, send you a series of uh, thank you electronic frames within a few minutes of our uh, session ending. And uh, just as a FYI, our next session will be next week on the 24th of February by Dr. Kenneth Lamunia Fitzhug. And it will be based on how is artificial intelligence used in sales. That will be our sixth seminar of this series. Professor Edwards, heartfelt thanks to you once again. Professor Yogesh, thank, 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 thank you for coming. So, just to obviously th big thank you from my side as well to Professor Edwards and thank you to Professor Sandeep Bhattacharya for very well coordinating the session. Thank you so much.